My name is Simon Brown from Just One Lap doing this evening's presentation. Psychology of trading, significantly more of pressure. I, I could talk on this subject until next month and I still wouldn't be finished. Trading happens in your head. More than anything, trading happens in the head. Predominantly, fear and greed. Uh, cognitive biases, we're going to touch on a bunch of them. I'm going to have to touch on the most important ones. I can't get to all of them uh, this evening. But if we can get particularly the fear and greed part, if we can get that part right, and if we can use the fear and the greed to actually improve our trading and improve what we're doing and, and, and almost use it as a feedback cycle, we can, we can actually start to get somewhere with our trading. Um, and quickly look at those. So those are the nine events that have happened prior to this. This is number 10. We've got 11 and 12, uh, which will be coming through in May and June, and then we kick off a, a new boot camp in, 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 in July. Videos are all at justonelap.com slash bootcamp. You can find those there. And this is Mark Douglas, who wrote what I think is the best book for traders. I will come uh, to a list of books at the end of the presentation. I can tell who's read the book, because everyone who's reading it is nodding deeply. And um, it's mental skills. Trading is about mental skills more than anything else. Now, I can teach you technical analysis quick, quick. I can teach you product be it CFDs or futures, quick, quick. I can teach you a trading system, quick, quick. The hard part that baffles us is the, the psychology of it. And the truth is that as human beings, a lot of what is critically important for us as human beings really hurts us in our trading. And we've got to break things that we are so comfortable with. We've got to break belief structures and the like. And the one, the example I always go to, <coughs> It's something that every single person in the world told you, and they all said to you, in order to succeed, you have to work hard. Everyone told you that. And it's not true at all, because we know people who didn't work hard and have succeeded. You know that oak at work, and you think, yeah, he doesn't deserve to be there. Um, you know people, and you probably think yourself, but certainly there are people who've, you know, who's worked incredibly hard and got nowhere. So things that we've been taught, things that we believe are not necessarily true. And this is what we've got to get through in the trading space. We've got to get into a comfort zone, which is not where we really want to be as human beings, not what really makes us comfortable as human beings. And that's what we've got to challenge and, 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 and get our way through. Um, and then I'll show you that map there. And everyone looks at it, and we immediately recognize it. Right? Map of the world. Upside down. Said who? It's just the map of the world designed by someone who lives in Cape Town. That map of the world is designed by the relevant king or queen. Hundreds of years ago, the cartographers went out, came back and said, we're going to draw a map of the world. And the relevant king or queen said, cool, put us in the middle at the top. So ergo, we have this. We think this is what the world looks like. Notwithstanding, none of us have been into space. Okay, I'm taking an assumption there. Anyone been to space? No. <laughs> None of us have been into space, so we actually don't know what the world looks like. But however, people have gone to space, they've taken photographs, they've sent them back to Earth. And yeah, that's the map of the world in a certain situation, but it depends where your spacecraft is. There's another problem with that map, it's flat, the world is round, which means that map is not drawn to scale. If you get a proper map of the world drawn to scale, firstly, Africa is actually quite skinny and long and significantly larger. Secondly, United Kingdom disappears. It's a speck of dust off the French coast. You know, a croissant pastry flake or something like that. Um, but we look at that and take it as a truth. And it's actually just a, I want to say representation, but it's actually not even a very good representation. So then I was playing around and I did that. Now that's completely wrong, surely, because that's got Madagascar on the west coast, unless you're inside Earth and you're looking. But again, it's what we believe. We think that is true. We look at that intuitively and we say something, no, not right. They're as true as each other. Just one lives in the UK, one lives in Cape Town. And I've seen an Aussie version, I've seen a, a, a Serbian version, I've seen different versions of maps of the world, just positioning it differently. And that's what I'm talking about this evening, is we need to, we, we're going to need to break through some thinking and some comfort zones. And, you know, when we start playing in our head, it can get deeply uncomfortable at points. And that, that's the process we need to go through in order to become a successful trader. If you look at what we've been running through, we've been leading to this point. The video 9, which included 
sort of getting real, some trading systems and the like, which was the, the, the March web the March event from last month, all online. Now we're to that really hard part. Many of you would have started and tried. The one point, if you've been trading a demo account, and I highly recommend a demo account, you have no idea what I'm talking about because in a demo account, there's no fear or greed, is there? Because there's no skin in the game, is there? There's no money. So demo accounts are beautiful, wonderful, and completely useless all in the same time. And I highly recommend them. But it gets real when you put money in. Yeah. That first trade you do, that box pops up and says, are you sure? <laughs> so what do you do? You shut the computer down because hell no, you're not sure. So fear and loathing. Let's start with fear and loathing. So there's a bunch of different ways we can tackle it, and, and I'm taking one particular one. You may have encountered others. There's different theories. There's different techniques. It's not that any are necessarily better than others. I just like this process. I find it, it fits quite well. Fear is quite simply focusing on what we think might happen and which we have no control over. And there's two critical points there. Think might happen. It might not, but we think it might. And that we have no control over. And that's the really, really hard part. So in other words, there's something in the future which might get really ugly on us, and there's nothing we can do about it. In truth, in the trading space, there is something you can do about it. You can exit the position. But that's essentially what a fear is. It's just that simple. Something that we worried may happen to us. We're not sure it will, but we worry about it. And, you know, the, the cliche is the two most useless emotions in the world are, are fear and, and, and guilt. And, 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 and the statement might be true, but it doesn't change it in the least. It's easy for me to stand up here and say, well, a projected outcome which we cannot control, well, if we don't know what's going to happen, we can't control it. Ach, just move on, don't be scared. No, come on, we've all seen horror movies. That's not how it works. Um, we, we need to manage that process. So what's the fears predominantly? Fear of being wrong. The fear of being wrong. So what did we do when we were raised? Again, in your work environment, what do you, you want to get things right, okay? You can be a trader. And if you're a top trader, you might have a, a, a win ratio of 60%, 40%. I know traders who make good money and they only have a win ratio of 35, 65. In other words, they write once and they're wrong twice. But when they're right, they make three times money. When they're wrong, they, lo they lose one times money. Imagine if your work environment, you write one and three times. You are what we, what we call unemployed. <laughs> Frankly, you are unemployable. So that, that, the first thing is fear of being wrong. And what are you what, what, wrong about what? Fear of losing money. The fear of being wrong is the easiest thing to solve. Because what are we doing? Focused on a projected outcome. In other words, are we going to make money or lose money? Something we cannot control. We're in the trade. Whether that trade makes us a profit or not, we have no control. We cannot control it. We're worrying about fear of being wrong. So how do we hack it? How do you measure wrong? Wrong is not losing money. No. Because that gentleman who has a 35% hit rate in his trading system makes money overall with his system. So you can't tell me when he loses a trade, it's a, it's a wrong trade. It's part of the process. It's the cost of doing business. I'll come to that in a moment. What's critically important is it's fear of being wrong. So what can we control? If we had to take away the cannot control and say can control. So what can we control? We can control what we trade, time frame we trade, instrument we trade. We can control when we enter, when we exit, where we put our stop loss. We can control the position size. And those who've been to an earlier presentation of mine know exactly where I'm going with this. Perfect trade. What can't we control is what will happen, whether this individual trade will make a profit or not. You go to work tomorrow and your boss says to you, we have a, no pro a new process for determining bonuses in this department. Your bonus is determined on how the Sharks do in the Super 12. Your comment is, the Sharks is the best rugby team in the world, just they're keeping that very secret. <laughs> you would object that that's not fair because you have no input into how the Sharks are going to do in the Super 12. And you would be right. We live in hope. <laughs> what we need to do is say, forget that. 
Manage what we can, what we can do. And manage it with position size. Part of fear of being wrong is we're going to lose money. That then feeds to we're going to lose so much money that it's going to be, you know, we've, we've, frankly, we've got too big a position. So the one way we hack it is by what do we measure. In other words, don't measure by profit or loss. The other way we hack it is we drop our trade size down and down and down. Because what do we do with our first trade? And maybe not our first trade, maybe our third trade. We hoy as much money as we think we can manage into it. Why? Because this is going to be a winner. Why? Because we're special. Why? Because your mother told you. <laughs> and your mother's a lovely person and was probably right. But you've gone big. You went big because you have optimism bias. Why? Because you're special. Why? Because your trades make money. No, they don't. Some of them make money. And you've gone too big. And you never looked at the other side of the coin, which says some trades make money, some trades lose money. And if this trade loses money, oh, Johnny's not going to school next year. Forget the website that doesn't work. You can't pay the school fees. Drop your trade size. Now, in, in, in the next uh, in, uh, the June event, we'll look at risk management. There's a bunch on just one lap around risk management. But the biggest problem traders have is we start to big. You, know, you want to be a, uh, I'm trying to think of a, of a realistic example, you want to be a racing car driver. You don't go buy a McLaren SL whatever racing car. You go start with a go-kart. Why? Because A, you don't know how to drive and B, you're going to crash it. And you crash a go-kart, it's going to cost you 50k. You crash a McLaren, man, you're going to be paying that thing off for seven generations. <laughs> Drop your trade size. There's one problem when you drop your trade size. It becomes insignificant, you don't care, so you abandon the rules. But if you can't be disciplined with a small amount of money, how the heck are you going to be disciplined with a large amount of money that is eating at your brain while you're trying to trade? So trade smaller. How, for how long? For as long as it takes. When I trade Aussie futures, I will at max trade 18 contracts. I need a lot going in my favor to trade 18 contracts, but I will get to 18 contracts. It has taken me, I only started trading 18 contracts October 2014. That was the first time I did an 18 contract trade, and of course it was a losing trade. That's just Murphy making sure I know he's still around. The point is it took me six years to get from three contracts to 18 took a long time to get to that point. I don't know. We're in a hurry. You're in the wrong place if you're in a hurry. We'll get to that in a moment as well. So you take that fear and you use it as a signal. You say, where is the fear? What is it that's fearing me? And how can I turn it around? How can I turn it on itself in a sense and use it? And then we say, what do we have? What can we influence? Whether this trade makes or loses money, you cannot influence. So remove that from the equation by making your trade size small enough so that it's insignificant. And that's always the case. Even a pro trader makes an individual trade so small that that trade doesn't matter. It's a collection of trades that matters. And then you say to yourself, and you, uh, video 7, which was the New Year's Trading Revolutions, which we did in January, and I've talked about it in earlier videos as well. Your perfect trade. These are the things you can measure. When you go to your boss and he says, we're going to measure you on the shark's performance, you turn around and say, no, measure me on these things that I control. There are seven things that you can control. Every one of those is completely something we can control. Every single one of them is something we've got control of. And you can, I mean, that list is what I use. You can add to it. You can subtract from it. That's your call. But you need that plan. I say it all the time, and we were talking about it before we started this evening. We have to have a trading plan. And we've gone through a couple of these in, in, in the previous videos, but we need to have a trading plan. And then we stress, and we get overly stressed about the, that what should the trading plan be. You know what? The actual plan is important, but not half as important as you sticking to it. If you don't have a plan, then there's one guarantee. You go bust. If you have a plan, you have a real chance of actually succeeding because you have something that is repeatable. You have something which is tweakable. If your trading is just completely random, you wake up in the morning, look out the window, and, oh, today we'll go long angler. And it works. Tomorrow you wake up and you're like, yo, how did I do that? So you look out the window and, like, nothing comes to you. 
But if you have a plan that says, you know what, if we have a 721 EMA crossover and the RSI moves up from below 30, then I go long angler and it works. You're like, hey, this thing works. Let's try it again. And look, it won't always work because you're not going to get a 100% success rate. But now you've got something which is repeatable and you've got something which is measurable and you've got something which if you feel isn't quite there, you can tweak it. I hate tweaking because we're going to refine it to oblivion, aren't we? Instead of using a 14 RSI, we use a 12.762844 because that's the magic number. Welcome to pain if that's your solution. But it, we need that plan. And part of that plan is your perfect trade. How do you execute a perfect trade? Now are we measuring ourselves on something that we can control. We have dropped our trade size down. So if we lose money, we're not bankrupt. Johnny still goes to school if you can get through the government department website. <laughs> and we can actually measure ourselves. And then your target is to do one perfect trade. Just one. And as soon as you've done one, your next target is two, and three, and four. I'm on 102 perfect trades in a row. But I'm the Hashem Amla of perfect trades, eh? I'm not single century go out. I'm aiming for triple century, and then, by then I'll be so old I won't be trading anymore. It's taken me about five years to get to this many trades. In fact, five and a half years. Oof, almost six. So 15, 16 trades a year is what I average. So we move it forward, we take that fear, we identify it. What do we typically do when we get hit by fear? Good old-fashioned response, head in the sand. If you want to be brave, ha, go drinking with your buddies. You know, blame somebody. The old classic way of managing fear, certainly in the trading space, and Mark Douglas falls into this a bit, but we will forgive him because at the time that was the response, was the idea to try and banish the fear, to try and completely remove it and become sort of, you know, non-humanoid, become robotic. Nice idea, in truth we are humans and part of being a human is emotion. Good or bad, it's there, we can't get rid of it. So what we do here is we identify. When you feel the fear, don't panic, stop. Boom. Why? What? How? Where? Make notes. And I'm being serious, write down what are you feeling? What is scaring you? What is out there that's making you feel this fear? And don't worry about it at the point. Just make the notes. You've got a trading journal. You just make those notes. Come back to them during what I will call rational time. When is rational time? Any time the market is closed. So come back to it during the evening or over the weekend or a public holiday or something like that. Come back to your notes and say, right, I had the fear. What was it? Fear of being wrong. Fear of losing money. Fear of Johnny not going to school. Identify the fear. It's usually actually quite simple to identify a fear. Once we want to. In truth, we will try not to. Because as soon as we actually identify that fear, a can of worms explodes into our face. But that's cool. We're happy with this. We'll you know, bring Kleenex. We can clean the face. Look down at it and say, what is it that's scaring me? And how do I manage this? How do I make it go? Part of that is plan. Part of that is perfect trade. Part of that is position size. And slowly it starts to go. And I mean... Does the fear, does it ever go? <sighs> I, I mean, so, so I want to, for selfish reasons, say yes, because I hope that I never have fear again. But I don't actually honestly believe that. My fear that I have, for me personally, is trading is not sticking to my plan, and my big fear is not doing a perfect trade. You know, I've got my first hundred in my perfect trades. I don't want to go back to zero, because if I do a non-perfect trade, back to zero, six years to get to where I am now. That's my fear. I then use that fear to drive me to make me a better trader. I do perfect trades. The biggest reason I do them, so that I don't go back to zero. So that I don't stand up here in a month and tell you that I've done two perfect trades and you will think, oh, what happened there? So partly it's my own shame and partly it's being shamed in front of all of you. Now, if there's one emotion bigger than fear, it's probably shaming. And we just turn it back on itself and we just say, you know, and, and it goes. And as I said, I don't think we ever completely get rid of it. I think it pops up in different places. I think we, lo we, we learn to manage it in certain places. But that fear of the trade, that fear of the losing money, that we can fairly simply remove from the equation. And I say fairly simply, I didn't say quickly. 
This is a process. Maslow, we've talked about Maslow. There's an entire video on becoming an unconsciously competent trader. Uh, so I'm not going to spend too much time, but I want to touch on that because it's important for the rest of the presentation. We start there. Unconsciously incompetent. You are useless and you are unaware of that fact. That is no one in this room. Because if you were useless and unaware, why have you given up your Tuesday night to fight the Santon traffic? You'll be sitting at home planning the billions you were going to make by Tuesday. Yes, today is Tuesday, but there's still six hours left, or however many still to go. So we all start there. Whatever we do, whatever it is in life, we start at unconsciously incompetent. And we have to grow from there. And we then move to consciously incompetent. We are now still useless, but we are deeply aware of our uselessness. We typically believe there is a secret. We typically think that somewhere there is a holy grail. What we typically do in this point here is we believe complexity is the answer. And we make systems that are pages long. And we make charts that are Christmas trees. They've got so many doilies and lines and bowls and things sitting on them. And it still doesn't quite work. And then we simplify. Trading is sim about simplicity. Because remember... The hard part about that is that everyone told you in order to succeed, work hard. So there's some hard work in trading. Yes, learning the skills, going through that process, going through managing the emotions. But the actual trading is click, click of a mouse. How many clicks? One, two, three, maybe four. That's it. I mean, no one can call that hard work. Um, and the managing of the trade. But where we need to succeed, the hard part is to understand that the actual trading system, the actual trading plan needs to be simple. And we don't believe that because we look at Elon Musk and we say, yo, we wish we could be Elon Musk. But the man's had like seven genius ideas and he's only 44. You know, I'm 46 and I haven't yet had a genius idea. <laughs> That's cool. Elon can have his genius ideas. But it's the simplicity and if you, if you, there's a book just out, and now I can't remember who wrote it or what the author is, Biography of Elon Musk. And if you, he talks about the simplicity all the time. He says, yes, going to space, going to Mars is not simple. He says, but you make the simple things you do around it. The one is a reusable rocket. So to send a rocket to space is 100 million US dollars. But if you can reuse that rocket... It costs 5 million US dollars per pop. Boom, the price just comes down 95%. All you've got to be able to do is land a rocket on a barge upside down in the middle of the ocean. Which apparently they can do, so no sweat, right? But the simplicity of saying, huh, why don't we use the rocket again? For 50 years, NASA and the Russians and everyone else have never reused rockets. That seemed insane because we couldn't get them back to Earth. Four years, Elon Musk has got them back to earth. And, and in truth, uh, Jeff Bezos, who's also trying to do the same, is also going to probably land a reusable rocket in the next month or two as well. So we need to get to simplicity. And when we have simplicity, then we get to consciously competent. We're now making money. It's not quite going well enough. Why? Because we think too much. Too much emotion, too much noise, too much opinion. The market don't care about your opinion, and you shouldn't care about its. Ultimately, we become to unconsciously competent where we trade brilliantly without thinking. You trade without thinking. Something which as human beings we are very good at doing. You drove here this evening. You did it without thinking. You walked from the door to here. You, you didn't think about every footstep you're making. Every breath you take, you don't think about it. But how do we get to that point? The first time you stood up and walked, and you don't remember this, but trust me, you fell down. Just because every kid, the first time they walk, falls down because you've never done it before. How come we're expert walkers? Practice. We've been walking a long time. Even those like me who are lazy, we still walk a lot. How do we become consciously competent here? Something that is simple. Walking, trading. Repeat again and again and again. And what is the repeat? Perfect trade. Having a plan. And you pull those all together, and the fear starts to go, and the trading starts to work. And then you think you're winning, and then I say to you, hello, cognitive biases. Cognitive biases is, and that's the fancy definition there, it's frankly stuff that's going on in your head, which is bad for you. And probably in truth, half of what's going on in our head is bad for you. Well, me for me and you for you. 
Um, these are some of the cognitive biases. The bad news is these are only some of them. Uh, a quick Wikipedia search or Google search found me 950 different cognitive biases. The good news is you did not have all 950. But as a human being, you have a bunch of them. That's what it is. This is what it is to be human. If we didn't have this, we're a robot. We're, we're android, we're nothing. Cognitive bias is what makes us human. Which is great. It's great being human. And it's important that as a human species we move forward and that we left the trees and that we're going to get to Mars and everything else. What's hugely important is that we identify the cognitive biases that we have and we iron them out. I'm not going to touch on all of these. I'm going to pull a couple of them. Simply, time doesn't allow. They're all out there. If you, I mean, a lot of them are, are fairly uh, uh, self-explanatory. And again, if you're being reflective on your trading, if you're making notes on what you're feeling and thinking, if you're going back to those notes and reviewing them during rational time when the market is closed, you will fairly quickly find the things that are, 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 are in the way, the things that are your personal stumbling blocks. And, and none of these are hard to, 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 to get rid of, um, except for one, and now I can't find it, uh, it comes up in a few slides time. It's not there. Nope, not there. Nonetheless, uh, the one that is perhaps harder than others, but when I point it out to you this evening, it will make it a whole lot easier. So loss of version bias. All the research, any research that you show, shows that losing t 10 rand is twice as painful as the joy of making 10 rand. We hate the pain. And that makes perfect sense. The one thing about money, not the one thing, many things about money, one of the key points about money is our relationship to money as a human being. It is bad. And that's on a good day. Think about the, the, the uh, uh, cliches and the like that circle around money. None of them are good. Fool in his money is soon parted. Uh, burn a hole in your pocket and so the list goes on. There's no like, you know, hey, pile of money, smiley man stories. No. You know, the, the, the money story is always, you know, horrible and, 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 and et cetera, et cetera. And, and the rich guy never gets the pretty girl. Uh, and so it goes on. And our personal relationship with money is deeply flawed. And we know this. I saw a great uh, a Facebook post, and if I summarize it, you, know, you pull up to the robot and you look at that guy with the, 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 the Bentley and you think, yo, oh, there's a rich oak. Uh, there's an oak with a million rand debt to the bank. Every one of us knows that. Yet oaks buy Bentleys. Why? Looks fancy. And we know that when we die and we have someone giving us a eulogy, no one is reading out our bank statement for two reasons. A, probably because the average person's bank statement is embarrassing <coughs> because they have managed to get to the end of the life with a big hole of debt. And two, because no one cares about your bank statement. So our response to money is bad. It's poor. It's weak. And it shouldn't be, but it is. That is just how it is. It's one of our, you know, <sighs> there was... It was actually a, 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 I want to say a prank video, but I mean, it wasn't serious research, but they did it in the U.S. And basically they were saying to people, either uh, you've got two choices, a bunch of university students doing uh, uh, to, on campus. And they said, your option is to either um, disclose your last three months spending habits or to walk naked across campus. One person opted, opted to show their money. Everyone else was like, cool, take the clothes off. Where do I walk? <laughs> Man, that's the wrong way around. That's fundamentally the wrong way around. So it's the fear of losing us twice as much. What do we do? We let our, loss, our, our losers run and we cut our winners. I've been there. I had two trades in the market. I forget what they were, not important. I was going on holiday with my lovely wife. I needed some money. I needed to sell one of the trades to get money so we could go on holiday. The one trade was making money. The one trade was losing money. Which one did I sell? I the one that was making money. Why? Because I locked in that rush of profit and I gave the loser the opportunity to become a winner. It didn't. No, no. We all know that, don't we? It became worse of a loser. And in fact, I came back. This was way back. This was before the internet. We were on holiday up the west coast, Alexander Bay. 
and we get a newspaper. So we get the morning paper in the afternoon. I rush to the paper to see the share prices. And I'm just losing money like there's absolutely no yesterday. Um, but there's no cell phone reception. It's not like I can phone anyone or do anything about it. But what did I want to do? I wanted that rush of the winning trade. We sell our winners too quick. The point with losing trades, firstly, the size matters. Secondly, it's just a cost. Trading is a business. And part of a business, we have costs, brokerage, data, subscriptions, and losing trades. The chap I was telling you about who makes money on three and a half out of ten trades, let's call it four out of ten trades he makes money. He can only do those four trades that make money if he has the six that lose. And it's not linear, I get that. They hodgepodled in terms of frequency. But in order for him, and let's say his winning trades, the four that make him money make five rand a trade, so they make him 20 bucks. And his losing trades lose him two rand a trade, so that loses him six. So he comes out ahead eight bucks. It's a business, right? The 20 bucks, which is his four winning trades, is revenue. But before you get to revenue, you've got costs. And the costs are those six losing trades. If you don't have those six losing trades, you don't have the business. If you want to have a hot dog stand at the beach, first you've got to go buy a stand. Hot dogs, rolls, tomato sauce, butter, serviettes, signage, license. Now you can start making the revenue. And trading, a losing trade, is a cost of being a trader. And we're going to have them. And it's not linear. You don't have four winners, six losers. If it was like that, it would be simple. Have your four winners and then don't do anything for six trades. It's never going to be linear. But when that losing trade comes, firstly, you've got your position size correct, so it doesn't hurt you. It's not going to bankrupt you. Johnny can still go to school next year. And when it comes, it's just a case of, well, was it a perfect trade? Yes. Well, cool. Then it's just a cost of doing business. It's a cost of being a trader. The trader who tells you they have a 100% win ratio has never traded or is lying. Or both. <laughs> no one, no one has a 100% win ratio. Most people struggle to get their win ratios to 60%. I used to target 65% as my win ratio. I gave that up over a decade ago. I, 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 I'm a trend trader. I now target 51% win ratio. I'm quite happy with 51. And because I trade infrequently, because I'm averaging 15 or so trades a year, the years get skewed. I've got years where I've got 90% win ratios, and I've got years where I've got 5% win ratios. It's just the cost of doing business. It's going to happen. That's fine. I treat it, and this was a trick that I learned many, many years ago. So let's say you're doing a trade. Let's say your down payment, your margin requirement is 10,000 Rand. And let's say if you get stopped out, you've lose 2,000. That 2,000 is the cost of entry to that trade. It's how much you pay to have the right to make money, to perhaps make money in that trade. View it as the price you pay for a movie ticket. You want to go see a movie this weekend, you pay how much? 50 bucks. I don't know. <laughs> I, I got internet, I don't go to movies. Um, let's say 100 bucks. You go to a movie on Saturday, it's going to cost you 100 bucks. Okay, no popcorn, no partner, no kids, just you buy yourself in the cheap seat 100 rand. You pay the 100 bucks. What are you going to get for it? You don't know yet. You might go see the best movie you've ever seen in your entire life. You might be sitting behind someone who's seven foot tall with a 12 foot uh, afro. You might be sitting next to a kid who spends the entire movie on their cell phone. You might go to a horrible movie. The projectionist might have forgotten to focus it. The aircon might be too cold. None of that is controllable by you. You have said, I want to try this movie. It fits my pattern of movies I would like. Here's my hundred bucks. Let's see what happens. You pay the money up front. The experience comes later. Trading, you pay the stop loss up front. It's the cost you pay to enter the trade. And if you do that emotionally in your brain, you say, right, this trade, 2,000 Rand. Hey, Mr. Market, here is 2,000 bucks. Please, sir, ma'am, can I enter this trade? Boom, in the trade. One of three things happens. 
Market comes back to you and says, trade's over, nothing for you, cheers, go home. Cool, okay, bad movie. Market comes back to you and says, trade's over, here's some money, but it's less than 2,000 rand. Eh, average movie. Market comes back to you and says, here's a bag of money and it's more than 2,000 rand. Might be 2,050, might be 3,000, might be 10,000. Boom. Blockbuster movie. Take that money out of your brain. View it as a cost of doing business. What are we doing here? We're hacking our brain. That's exactly what we're trying to do. We're hacking our brain to make it do what we need it to do. We're hacking it to make it work the way we need it to work in order for us to become successful traders. Confirmation bias. So what we believe, we give more weight to. If we believe that uh, the world is a complete and utter mess and that all this quantitative easing is going to end in tears and that in truth what we should be stockpiling is water, pumpkin seeds and bullets, every chart you look at is bearish. Every chart you look at. And if you believe that Janet Yellen and Drachi and Abe in Japan are the smartest people the world has ever invented and that printing money until we run out of trees is absolutely the right solution and that the Dow Jones is going to 100,000 and the top 40 is going who knows where, then every chart you look at is bullish. And welcome to the internet where whatever you believe not someone else out there. There are five Facebook groups out there that agree with you. Five that pop up immediately. There's another 50 behind them that you think are a little bit wacky and you're not sure about those ones. This is the internet. Hey? The, I, so uh, the problem is, and I'll give you an example. So I, I, I remember late 90s, I had internet. It was terribly exciting. I was, where was I living in those days? I must have been mid-90s because I think I was still in Peter Maritzburg. And I wanted to buy a warrant. It's October 1997 because warrants have just come out. I want to buy a warrant. There are three. SAB, Nedbank, Sassel. I decide I should buy the Sassel warrant because I own Sassel shares. So I decide I need to go build a case study to buy the Sassel warrant. I didn't think about looking at a chart. I, didn't, I mean, the only charts I had were done with pencil on graph paper, and I hadn't been charting Sassel. So what do I do? I boogie off to my newfound tool, the internet, and I go and I'm looking for proof that Sassel should be a good buy. So I go and I discover these long-range weather forecasts that says the northern hemisphere is going to have a colder-than-usual winter. Ha-ha! Colder than usual winter, more heating required, demand for oil, oil price up, Sassel goes up, boom, there's my reason. My lovely wife says, yeah, okay, she agrees with all of that, but colder than usual winter, more heating, people are staying at home, they're not driving their cars, they're using less petrol, they're using less oil, oil, oh. <laughs> no, that problem was simple. My wife didn't know what she was talking about. I went and bought the Sassel warrant. And I'm not telling you how that ended. <laughs> Whatever you want to prove, you can prove it. Do not go looking for the evidence because you will find it. And the fact that you find the evidence does not make it true. Back in the day, and now I'm talking way back in the day, you know, before telephones and the like, our communities were, were dozens or perhaps hundreds of people unless we happen to live in a large city. But 95% of us lived in communities of less than 100 people. And everything we believed came from those communities. And there was no outsiders because there was no way to open our eyes and be outsider-ish and to take a contrarian view. But now our community is, you know, three and a half billion people connected to the internet. So if you are a one in a million person, there are three and a half thousand of you. So you believe something that is so crazy that only one in a million people believe it. There are three and a half thousand people who believe that very, very crazy thing. Hence, there are not five Facebook groups, there are 500 Facebook groups and 17 chat forums, etc., etc. We need to come to trading with an open mind, or better yet, come to trading with a closed mind. 
There is one truth. It's price. There's one thing that matters. Our system. Our plan. Our plan says buy. That's what matters. Our plan says don't buy. That's what matters. Nothing else matters. Closed mind. Turn off the TV. It's noise. If I'm on your TV, don't you dare. <laughs> There's a little red light, and every time someone turns the TV off, the little red light goes off, and you all get sad. <laughs> okay, there isn't, but imagine if there was. And I've talked about this a lot in previous presentations, so I'm not going to delve into it too much now. But none of that helps your system. If your system is, 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 is predicated on watching CNBC or Business Day TV or Bloomberg or, or some chat forum or some Facebook group or some Skype group or something like that, you're, it's not going to work because you're going to have the confirmation bias. You're going to go to what you believe. Let me shut that down. by And just in trading, I don't mean be closed-minded in life. I mean in the trading space. So I would talk trading all day. And I will tell people what my trades are, and I'll ask them what their trades are. But when it comes time to enter a trade, I don't care what the conversation is. I'm in a chat group. I went long in D25 about four weeks ago. As I was saying earlier, I've made 12 cents on a 50 grand trade. 12 cents. Literally 12 cents. Anyway, nonetheless, because the ND has gone exactly nowhere. At that point, I'm going long. I'm in this, 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 this uh, WhatsApp -y chat group, and everyone in there is just bearish. But you know what? They've been bearish since the, the crash. The crash was 69, hey? not the recent crash. <laughs> and, and I tell them I'm going long indie, and they all come with reasons why I shouldn't. Uh, BTI is breaking down, SAB is breaking down, and the pound is strengthening bad for SAB. Boom, 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 and they've got lists of reasons, and they've got charts, and they've got, you know what, and very compelling, and frankly, they're better technical analysts than me, a very convincing story. And what did I do? I ignored them. I went long the indie. And so far, I'm right, eh? I've made 12 cents. <laughs> okay, all I'm telling them is that I'm right. I haven't mentioned the quantum of 12 cents. <laughs> That's on a need-to-know basis. But hey, so what if I'm wrong? So what? This trade is still going. This trade might cost me money. It cost me 8,000 Rand, the ticket to enter this trade. That 8,000 Rand is gone, no longer mine. Boom, history finished. My job is just to follow the rules. The system will tell me when to get out. Will it make me a profit or not? I don't know. In truth, I don't care. What do I care? That I do the right thing. I care that I have a perfect trade. That I care about. That I can manage. And I know that if I lose money, those oaks on the WhatsApp chat group are going to give me all shades of stick. That's fine. I can mute them. I'll show them a chart of the S&P. All-time high for the year, through 2100, hot now through butter. Two can play this game. And it's great banter, but it's just that. It's banter. You know, I will tell you the Sharks are the best rugby team in the world until you say to me, put 10 bucks on it. It's like, don't be stupid. Have you, <laughs> have you seen how they play? <laughs> they're the best rugby team in the world when they're in the change room. Don't let them near a rugby ball. Optimism bias, we believe that we are less at risk than others. We are special. Our mothers told us so. We have done our homework. We no longer listen to that Facebook group. We no longer subscribe to this WhatsApp chat forum. We have banished them into the ether. We are special. We are clever. We are supreme trader. Ergo, less risk. Wrong. We manage our risk, but we never remove the risk. And if we start to believe our own nonsense, we're going to wipe out. Overconfidence is a killer in the trading space. Why? Two things we do with overconfidence. We trade too big and we ignore stops. The worst thing that can happen to you as a trader is that your first trade makes you a lot of money. Your first trade makes you a lot of money and you think, yo, that was easy. Where's Johnny's school fees? Come on, I'm going to take Johnny's school fees and I'm going to go long oil. 100 to 1 leverage, boom, problem solved. The best thing that can happen is at the first trade, you just lose like a dinner. Not too much, just like a dinner, just to keep us grounded. And that's my story and I'm sticking to it because my first 17 trades lost me dinners. That process helps. Yes, the process does make us less at risk because we have process. Um, but that risk is still real. And the point with it, 
is how we stay less at risk is by staying in the plan. The risk is that being in the plan, we get confident and we move out of the plan. I said earlier that I will adjust a trading plan, but I'm very reticent to do it. To the point that I have an annual process at the end of the year where I will adjust trading plans. And during the course of the year, I take notes. And, you know, people chirp me on Twitter and I have brainwaves and people make great suggestions. And I make notes of all of these great suggestions. And at the end of the year, I sit down and I say, cool, these are the suggestions that I've got from me and from others on how to adjust my trading plan. And then I look at whether I should or shouldn't. As a rule, I don't. Not because the ideas aren't good, but because the plan works. And when I change a plan, do I make it better or not? Well, we don't know, do we? A tweak to a plan may improve it, but a tweak to a trading plan may break it. Now, when you're starting, it's different. When you're starting, there's going to be a lot of tweaking and adjusting because it's new. But once you've got that plan going and it's running and it goes nicely and it has the winners and has the costs of business which we otherwise know as losers and it's going lacquer, what we then start to say is, cool, let's not tweak it. Remember the olden days, you won't remember, with the bunny ears on your TV, right? You would like move it, move it, move it, suddenly, picture, don't move. <laughs> Same with your trading plan. Man, the thing works, don't move. Stand there, even if it's uncomfortable. And then uncertainty principle, and I know we're bringing quantum physics into this, but trust me, the quantum part's not important. Um, what is important is that we like certainty in the, this life and we believe in certainty. Basic quantum says that when you look at something, you change its state. Therefore, I can only know where it is or how fast it's going because the state is changing. Excuse me. And that therefore brings to certainty. Old science, pre-quantum, quantum came out of chaos, which came out of uh, meteorology, weather in the 1950s. Fascinating story if you care about it, but if you don't, I mean, go Google it if you are. Before that, science believed in certainty. Black and white, if you will. And quantum comes along and says, nah, no certainty. Because when you look at something, you change it. And therefore, when you measure something, you change it. And therefore, you don't know what you're measuring or what you're changing. And how does this come to trading? So in the world that we live in as human beings, we quite like certainty. I know we like to pretend that we are like a little bit radical and that we quite like to living on the edge and stuff like that. Nonsense. We like certainty. You want to be quite certain that no one's going to invoice you for this evening's presentation because that's what we promised. You want to be certain that when you stamp your ticket and go downstairs, you won't pay for parking because that's what we promised. You want to be certain that when you go into the streets of Gauteng, everyone will be driving on the left-hand side of the road, which is the right side of the road, if that made sense, because that's how it works. We actually do crave certainty. And we come to the stock market, <clears throat> and we try and impose a concept of certainty on the market. Because as human beings, that's what we are. We are creatures of certainty. So welcome to the stock market, where I used to say the only certainty we have is that the market will open at 9 and close at 5. And then one day the JSC had technical problems. And the market opened at 2 and closed at 7. So now I say the only certainty that we have is tomorrow the sun will rise. And if it doesn't, it's crashed into the Western Hemisphere and nothing matters anymore. We are 45 seconds away from burning up. The market is completely uncertain. <clears throat> we like to believe that if, we, if X happens, Y follows. Because what, that's how we walk, right? I just told you about unconscious competence. I've just told you about driving a car. How do we drive a car? Well, you push the accelerator, the car goes forward. The revs get high, you off accelerator, on clutch, change gear, off clutch, on accelerator. And it works. Welcome to the market. Where there is no direct linear relationship. We look at correlation. One of the big things you'll say is, oh, look, look at correlation between assets or between stocks. Yeah, okay, correlation's lack, it's an XOR equation, you can go and do it, excuse me, and then you square it, and you get a number between minus 1 and 1, 1 perfectly correlated, minus 1 perfectly inversely correlated, zero chaos relationship, none between the two. But here's the point, firstly, pick your time frame. You pick any two assets, 
you can find a time frame at which they correlate. You just got to find that time frame. But more importantly, what's gone before does not indicate what will happen in the future. That correlation can break down. So we had a correlation, when I say we, planet Earth had a correlation between coal and oil. An inverse correlation that had played out for about 30 or 40 years. And it's now broken. And it's been broken for the last two years. Is it going to get back in sync? I have no idea. But everyone, the story two years ago was quite simple. Short oil, long coal. You made a killing on the short oil. Unfortunately, you got killed on the, sorry, killing on short, on short oil, killing, and you got killed on coal because coal, is, you think oil's fallen, you ain't seen nothing yet. Coal is further need more. There's an energy unit, so it's a scientific theory. There's a, units of energy in a barrel of oil versus units of energy in a ton of coal, and they should be broadly in line. So this has got science behind it until it falls over and doesn't work anymore. And then it's just got crackery behind it. We love to find patterns. We love to say that there's those high levels of certainty. In the market, the only certainty we have is how we will respond to a situation. And really, there's only two responses that we need. At one point, our system is telling us to enter a trade. And our response is to enter the trade. At another point, our system is telling us to exit a trade. And our response is to exit the trade. Everything before, in between, and after is irrelevant. And if you start pattern hunting and looking for certainty, you're going to find it everywhere. And you're going to be able to do nothing with it. There's a brilliant website called SpuriousCorrelations.com. And he goes and finds, so my favorite is uh, the number of, uh, what is it? The number of no black nominees for Golden Globes and Oscars is directly correlated with the number of people who die while brushing their teeth. <laughs> no, go look, it is. So this year, when there was like hardly any black nominations, the number of people died from brushing their teeth is way down, historic lows. And you've got to say, man, that's spurious. That is, that is complete nonsense. And he just goes and finds this crazy data and brings two completely unrelated things together and says, hey, look, there's a correlation between the temperature in Atlanta and how many people die by stepladder in California. Because the data says there is, because when you chart them, they're in sync. And that's completely and absolutely meaningless. Trade the plan. That's your only certainty. That's the only thing you can control. Nothing else matters. Ah, that's what I was looking for. Blind spot bias. <laughs> so, we can see everybody else's biases, but we don't have any, hey, do we? Yeah, side eyes from the kid. You've got biases. The ones I'm talking this evening, maybe not so prevalent to you. You have biases. They are real. Some are going to be more, relevant, re, 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 uh, more important to you. Some are going to have more impact on you. Some might not. For whatever reason, that's fine. But start looking at what you're doing. When you're looking at a trade and it feels uncomfortable, why does it feel uncomfortable? It feels uncomfortable because you've got a bias. Probably because you've got a view that is counter to the trade. Well, that's fine. Having a view is perfect, but not in the trade. Go find that view, go squash it. Not in the world, just go squash it in your trading space. I never warned you about the next slide. Greed. So this was a, a podcast I did last week where I was talking about expectations. Christia, my colleague sitting in the corner there, and I never warned her that she was coming up on the slide. Uh, I meant to. Um, went on a Twitter rampage. I love Twitter rampages. And basically she said, the, the problem is, so the expectations, we want to be rich in a hurry. And I'm talking Friday. I'm talking this Friday. I'm talking tea time. I'm talking morning tea because I have plans for the afternoon. So we think trading is the answer. No. You want to get rich in a hurry? One way you do that. Marry money. Everything else takes time. You can tell... No, I didn't. <laughs> oh, you find where the rich people hang out and go hang out with them. I didn't marry money, so I'm not the expert there. 
And for the record, neither did my wife at the time. We were both as poor as each other. We were a perfect fit. The point being is we're trying to smack it out the park. Because Steer's point was, quite simply, if you are needing trading to be your salvation, you have bigger problems and trading is not the answer. The problem is your spending is out of control. The problem is you have a job that is horrendous. Your problem is, your problem is somewhere else. You need to fix those problems because trading is not your solution. And if your, tra if your plan is to be rich by Friday, there's only one way to do it, and that's to bet the farm and everything else that you own. And that might work once. It might even work five times. It might even work ten times. Come on, you've tossed a coin. How many times have you got heads in a row? But eventually tails comes. And if you're betting the farm every time, one day you lose the farm. And then that's it, eh? Then it's game over. There is no reset button. There is no go back to a previous saved version. This is it. So process. Trading at its core is probably the most boring thing you do. You think your job is boring? Welcome to trading. I know, it's fun, it's thrilling, it's all of those things. Question, if it's fun and thrilling, how's the money? How much profit are you making from that thrilling fun? Trading is boring. It's about processes, it's about plans, it's about record keeping, it's about introspection, it's about constantly going back and checking yourself, it's about marking your trades, it's about not letting biases get in the way, it's about never getting you know, a hot tip on a WhatsApp group and you rush off and buy NX and the thing quadruples in price and you make a fortune. That happens in the movies and only in the movies. And in fact, in the good movies like Margin Call, it happens the other way, and they all lose their money. Best movie about trading, Margin Call. Always be analyzing yourself again and again. We've got to keep ourselves on that straight and narrow. It's not by mistake that I have 100 plus perfect trades. It is by design. It is by effort. It is by, I make that happen. I didn't just stumble into it one day and get lucky. It's a process. It took me a long time to get there, and it takes effort and work and dedication to keep it there. So always be asking two questions to ask yourself every time you find yourself in a corner. Question one, what's the worst thing that can happen? You get stopped out. You lose a predetermined amount of money because you knew before you entered the trade where your stop loss was. You know what your risk was in the particular trade. The worst thing that can happen is that you lose some money. And you don't have to tell your friends on the forum. You can go and lie to them and tell them that you were short. They won't know any better. So the worst thing is we lose some money. The same money which I earlier said is just a cost of doing business. The same money which I before that said makes small enough so it doesn't matter. And that's the worst thing that can happen. Man, there are people out there who haven't got dinner tonight and we're worried about losing a predetermined amount of money that we can afford because we've worked it out. That is not pain or suffering or anything like that. That's a part of doing a business. The second question is what's the best thing that can happen? We make a pile of money. So much money that tonight, forget Johnny Blue. Blue is the wrong color. What are we drinking? I don't know. Johnny Navy. <laughs> Off the top of my head, I can't think of a more expensive whiskey. Verve Coco, by the barrel. Forget by the case. So really, our downside is, frankly, small, immaterial, and frankly, insignificant. And our upside is real. Now, we're not going to make enough money to go and buy a small East European country. Not in one trade. Because if you've made sure that how much money you're risking is small enough, it doesn't matter, how much money you make is not going to change your life either. However, if you do that often enough and repeatedly, again and again and again over a period of time, it starts to add up. And it starts to get real. It's just not happening any time this week. Frankly, probably not any time this year. So the only truth touched in this, it's about price. The other bits are noise. We focus on price because it gets rid of our, of our biases, of our cognitive biases. We focus on price because it removes us from the uncertainty principle. We focus on price because it gets rid of the chat forums and the Facebook groups and the crazies who are out there on the internet. 
If price is the only thing that matters and price is your chart, it tells you to buy, it tells you to sell, it tells you to sit on your hands. Three valid positions. So this is the slide from last month, which I grabbed again. Trade the plan. Uh, in video... That's not right. Video 7. Video 9. Um, FX and index trading. There are two trading plans that you can look at. The news trading and the lazy trading system, which are trading systems that I... The, the news flow I have used and the lazy I currently trade. I'll come back to that in a second. They're there. They are viable trading systems. They will not, I repeat, not make you rich anytime soon. But they will make you money. And what's nice about them, particularly the lazy one, is it's very simple. So there's no rocket science, very little space to make errors. And I tweet it. It works. It's on the website. So it's an easier place in many senses to start. Instead of learning to sail on the you know, Bermuda Triangle, you learn to sail in the bathtub. Small boat, but it works. Uh, demo account, I said this last time, I'm going to say it again. Start in the demo account. I know it's not real. The point about the demo account is that you don't want to have real money on the line and you're thinking, what's this limity thing, uh, partial, f what's this button here? When you're trading cash, you must not just know what that button is. You must be able to find that button with your eyes closed. That's why they have demo accounts. So that you can learn the system. So that you can learn the product. Always be learning. Always be asking. Asking of yourself and asking of others. We learn by asking questions. So we learn many ways. We, we, we learn by this evening. We, we learn by asking. There are no bad questions, only bad answers. Anything that you don't know now, the person who's giving the answer, once they didn't know it. And if they're going to be arrogant about it, just find someone else to ask. No, I'm serious. Life's too short for arrogant people. Alexander Elder, best trades. The goal of trading is to be a brilliant trader, not to make money. A byproduct of being a brilliant trader happens to be money. If the focus is money, it won't work. Focus on the trading. Uh, some books. So that's a bunch of them. The bottom two, so the very bottom one is more how our brains work. Super forecasting uh, is more about how we predict and the like, which is fun but not applicable to your trading. Trading in the Zone, best book ever written in the whole wide world. Uh, I have read it 13 times. The reason that pile of books on the side is all looking old and grubby, because if your trading books don't look like that, you're never going to be a trader. I've read Trading in the Zone 13 times. Came out in 2001. I read it every single Christmas except one or two when I've missed it. Van K. Tharp, Alexander Elder, Reminiscence to Stock Operator. Brilliant, brilliant book. The best way to do them, uh, audio. So the super fast forecasting book I've read twice this year already because I got it on audio book. Listened to it in January, listened to it again last month. I'm going to come back to that. I know folks are clicking through. Next presentation, 17 May, uh, and then 21 June, and then this series is over. I was talking about my lazy system, 12th of May, a webcast totally dedicated to the lazy system. Go to justonelap.com slash events. You can book, you can attend. It is free, no restrictions. If you can't make it, the video will be online a day or two later. This trading system can be used on FX and indices. It can be used geared or ungeared. It can be used from a five-minute to a monthly time frame. Lawyers. Remember the lawyers. Oh, nope, they're the lawyers. Contact details. Ladies and, quest ladies and gentlemen, I've run my time. Uh, I was going to say questions, but I've run my time, so I'm going to park the questions. If you've got questions, come, come chat to me. We're going to periscope some of your questions. So if you've got a question, you might end up on the interwebs asking the question. If that scares you, that's fine. Then mail me instead, simon at justonelap.com, if the interwebs scares you. What happens in your head is going to det determine whether you succeed and or make money. It is hugely important that we get it right. It is in some sense, it's completely daunting. But in truth, this is something which as human beings, we're actually fairly good at. 
We're fairly good at identifying our emotion. The reason we don't is because we refuse to. But if we're forced to identify an emotion, we're usually quite good at it. And if we're forced to identify the root of the emotion, and we're honest with ourselves, we're usually quite good at it. This is not rocket science. This is not something that anyone in this room can't do. Every single person in this room has the skill to manage the mental, the psychological side. Because that skill is quite simple. Heartbeat. And the preparedness to do it. It won't be easy, and it won't necessarily be quick, but it is certainly is 100% achievable. Ladies and gents, we'll leave it there. I appreciate your time this evening. I am, as I said, about six minutes over. Apologize. Quick housekeeping uh, parking tickets, please validate those. There's still coffee and food. Help yourself at the back. Thank you very much for your time this evening. <laughs>